Jazz Rabadia, welcome to the Branded Podcast. I'm so excited to have you. Super excited to be here. I am in the presence of someone with an MBE. I feel like I need to give you like a curtsy or something when you worked in, walked into the office. I'm really excited to talk to you about like why you have your MBE. Um, for those people that don't know, do you want to give us yeah. a little bit of a taster for who you are and what you're doing currently and then we'll dig into how you got there? Awesome. I always struggle with this because I don't know exactly how to define myself, but Jazz Rabadia, um, I work in the field of sustainability. I'm a mum of two. Uh, I've got a real passion for engineering and all things engineering, particularly driving more girls, uh, young girls into engineering. I love to play netball, football, tennis. Um, I grew up with two older brothers, so that's probably giving you a bit of a snippet as to the kind of competitive and sporty side in me and possibly the engineering side in me, because it was always around getting muck, mucking in, yeah. uh, being creative, uh, understanding how things work. So I'd say, yeah, I'm inquisitive, creative. Um, yeah, and I just like to celebrate life. I love that. I'm the same. I, lo I love just living life. And I think people, me, people make it sound like it's really difficult to do that, but actually it's quite quite simple which is probably why it's so hard right anyway we'll dig into that in a minute so going back to your childhood you mentioned that you've got brothers and like you were very much like you know rolling around in the mud and I was too so my I have one brother mm -hmm. but my dad grew up on a farm and so we used to go up to my grandparents farm like every weekend and of course there was like literally like knee deep in horse shit and various different <laughs> things at any given time and like playing in the forest and that kind of stuff so I can totally relate but going back to your childhood to now like what's your what's your journey been like and how did you get into sustainability and responsible kind of conscious capitalism yeah always been quite academic um and I, it was never really like drilled into me it was just uh, one of the unsaid things is like you study hard uh, my parents and my parents migrated here in the 1970s um, we were always conscious of the fact that they'd worked really hard to come to the UK and that we had almost like a duty uh, to like do well. Um, a lot of pressure. Yeah, but it was never, it was never like, we were never sat down and said, Was that like you should internal do well. pressure? Yeah, yeah, exactly. To, yeah. It was like, mm, we know that you've worked hard, so we have to kind of continue that ethic, the work ethic that they, I suppose, subconsciously ingrained in us. So it was always around doing well. Um, but actually my, and I did great in school up until my A-levels, which, it's probably when boys <laughs> started becoming a thing. Uh, so I lost focus. I didn't really get, I didn't do well in exams. I was always kind of great in class, mm. but that exam pressure really got to me. So my A-levels were not great, which was probably the first turning point in my life where I was not, no longer top of class, you know? Mm. And so I really had to rethink. So I got three Cs, which actually you could argue was great, but it wasn't going to cut it for the engineering degree that I wanted to pursue. Mm. And so I was like, found myself in this place of, shit, we need to rethink this mm. plan. Uh, and I felt like I'd let people around me down. Um, but didn't, it was either gonna go one way or the other. So it was gonna be another retake year, which I didn't want to do, or it was gonna be, actually, let's just, we know, I know I've got it in me, so let's just give uni a shot. Mm. Um, so I went through clearing, uh, got my, secured my place in an engineering degree, uh, and then just thought, this is my opportunity to turn it all around. Mm. So. Do you think that that was a bit of like a, a wake up call of like, actually you need to like focus, like that kind of yes almost Yes and failure. no, because my first year at university was also not very. Yeah, but I don't think anyone yeah, else no, is. Nobody's is, but. Um, I just wanna get through to the second year, don't you? That's kind of the point. Exactly. <laughs> I, got, I got through year. this to survive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got through to the second year and I thought, actually this is it. So this is kind of how I got to where I got to. Wanted to do engineering, not because, yeah, I wanted to be an engineer, but just because I thought, I know this is gonna turn heads. I know that there's not very many women in this field to help me stand mm. out. So I think that was the moment at which I thought, don't follow the grain, like go against the grain because that will help you shine. And um, so I didn't love engineering as such, but I had to take some additional modules, which I chose mm. energy management, renewable energy. And that was the moment the penny dropped. I was like, okay, hold on a minute. I can apply my engineering skills, which is based on maths, chemistry, science, physics and I can apply it to the real world, but also make a difference, which I truly believe is why, like, why I'm here, mm. like, to add value, to make a difference, like, really purpose-driven career that could come out of this in, in the world of sustainability, and that's what turned it all around for me. It was taking two modules, which, in all honesty, I chose because they were the easiest out of all the options I had. I was I gonna had. say, why those two? Yeah, genuinely, because it was that, or 
computer-aided design or thermodynamics. And I was like, mm, renewable like energy sounds, renewable energy. sounds less intense. And so, yeah, it was like on a whim that I chose those subjects, but I, I would eagerly go to those lectures. It, it then made sense to me. I was like, mm. this is what engineering means to me. And this is what I want to want the world to wake up to. It's like, whoa, this is a career that I never even knew existed. Mm. And bearing in mind, this is a good 16, 17 years ago. So mm. c- sustainability wasn't even a thing. It wasn't a buzzword. I was going to say, I'm amazed they were teaching it. Because yeah, like, I, the, I even think now sustainability has only just become like mainstream and very recently. Yeah, only, one of the only universities at the time uh, offering that as a mm. course. And now there's probably only one or two universities that don't, don't offer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I yeah. got onto the train at the, at the right time, but turning point in my life for sure. It's interesting, you know, because I, so I had that same click moment um, of like education when I was at A-level. I hate, so I was the opposite to you. We we both flipped at the same point. So I hated school at A-level. Mm. <laughs> I thought it was terrible. My teachers were really uninspiring. Mm. Um, you know, everything was about grades and and there was so much pressure on you to do well and that was like the sort of validation of you as a person is like whether or not you got an A. And I didn't have that pressure internally or from my parents, luckily. But school, the schools I went to are very like, if you don't get an A, you're not good enough to be here kind of thing. And that's just not who I am. Like, I don't think it's any surprise I now run a business that basically has broken all the rules to do with marketing because that's who I was. I broke rules Mm. all the time. But when I got to A level, I had one teacher, and I actually have a tattoo on my rib cage of a saying that he used to say all the time because that man inspired me so much. And I don't think I would be where I am today if I hadn't been inspired to learn mm. um, from him. But yeah, it was my A levels where I was—it was almost like someone came down from the heavens and shook me and was like, "You know, learning could be fun, right? Like, you know, you can learn about something that you actually like doing, and it doesn't have to be like a turn up to lectures and just have to write stuff down off the board situation." Do you think that, you know, I did, wasn't going to talk about this, but I think it's an interesting topic. Do you think that the education system is somewhat limiting to what children believe is possible? For sure. I mean, it's getting better. So so STEM, as a, by the way, I'm super intrigued as to what the tattoo says. Memento mori, which means everyone dies. <laughs> Okay. And what subject did he they teach? He used to come into the office and he'd like um, English lit, okay. but it's funny because all the all the subjects that we would study, um, all the books we would study would be like Dracula, Frankenstein, okay. like and I, and I was just like, and he would go into really in depth detail like the Tempest, right? So Shakespeare, and he'd be like, well, this is clearly some kind of, you know, um, paternal and like love for his daughter, and that is why he's creating all this chaos. And he'd be like he made you like look at the psychology behind the books as opposed to just read the books. And I was like, and you know, now I run a marketing agency that basically leverages psychology to yeah. get a competitive advantage so yeah he used to come into the uh the um the classroom with this mass he had this like cape like I, that's the only way i can describe it was like it was a mac coat but it was kind of like a cape and he'd fling it open and be like memento more and then he would start the class and that meant that is like in latin for a yeah. reminder of death so like don't waste time because yeah. we're all gonna die and yeah it just it stuck with me for a really long time so yeah tattooed on my rib cage interesting <laughs> um, so education system, do I think it's geared to... Inspiring something? children to actually want to pursue their career. Because you and I are both very fortunate to be in positions where we love what we do. Mm. Um, and 99% of the population are not in that position. So I'm wondering whether you feel like, you know, you had that moment when you picked that course just purely yeah. by fluke. Yeah. Would you have enjoyed your job as much if you hadn't, you know? Yeah, certainly my experience, and, and I still interact with um, students, right? So I go back and I try to, again, educate them and inspire them with what it's like in the real world. So I think I definitely think there's a still a huge gap between what we're taught in school and how the world actually operates. And I think that people stick to what they know, which mm-hmm. is, you know, here are the types of careers. Doc- I get it now at my son's school. What do you want to be? A doctor, a firefighter. And it's like all these traditional jobs. Um, or how they how p- traditional jobs might be perceived but one of the pieces of advice I give to the students is l- be curious go and find out what your auntie your uncle your friend's mom what they do for a living mm-hmm. especially when you're at that age of around 14 15 you're making your choices you know life choices essentially um, in terms of what you might study or careers that you might pursue and I think that the only advice that I could offer is go and find out what people do mm-hmm. and then see if there's something that excites you about that role go and buddy someone, go and shadow, work shadow them, um, quiz them uh, on all the things that you uh, want to understand about kind of like the day job. So I think that also we as practitioners have got a duty to kind of share what it means to be in, in marketing, what it means to be in sustainability, what it means to be a doctor, an engineer, whatever it might be. I think 
we also have to um we've got a duty to yeah give back to the, the younger generation Put the ladder and, back down yeah and also like inspire but educate empower whatever it might be it's they just don't know what they don't know and mm. we can help them know more do you think though like where we are in 2024 that there is kind of like almost too many options because i see like we employ a lot of and i don't mean this in a patronizing way or in a in any other way than i intend to explain what i'm saying we employ a lot of young people and i'm 33 so i'm not exactly old but a lot of the the team are a lot younger than me um which comes with loads of pros which is they're they're way better at social media than me like they're way more in touch with what's going on and there's a huge amount of value that they bring to the business which is why we have so many young people working in the business but the opposite side of that is i wonder whether but rather i don't wonder i know from having one-to-one -one conversations with them that they do suffer from what i would call over analysis paralysis where there are so many options in mm. their career and there are so many people that they're connected to on TikTok or, or linkedin or their friends or the whatever who are doing this that and the other thing that there's a lack of like almost focus of like where that next step is and i worry sometimes because when i you know when you and i were kind of coming through the ranks it was like right the goal is to get to that next level, like mm -hmm. the next level up from where you are. It, it, you might have had a big picture goal, I didn't. I was like, I just want to be a team manager. Then when I was a team manager, I wanted to be this manager. And it, it was just kind of like, you know, figuring out what you liked and sort of working in that direction. Whereas I think now there are so many options, which is really amazing because, you know, you're not a doctor, lawyer, like whatever, but almost too many. It's like when you go yeah. to a restaurant and there's like a thousand things on the menu and you're like, Jesus Christ, do I want sushi or a burger? I'm not sure. And I think a lot of people suffer from that but, and it makes them feel like they lack purpose, which yeah. then means that they just don't really enjoy life as much. I mean, I go for both, by the way. I, I love it, right? It started making, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but that's I love, the point, right? I love having, having all the options. That's the point, is you can do both, you but know? Both I'm, I'm can't. probably guilty of it. So yes, I'm known as a sustainability professional, but I also, there's so many other kind of things that I am passionate about and that I pursue in and out of the day job. And I think that, I don't think it's it's necessarily a young people's mm. challenge. I think it's a, it's it's the the circumstances that we're now all operating in, right? So I'm thinking, okay, I've been doing sustainability for 50, 15 years. Uh, there's only so much that it satisfies me, right? The day mm. job, where else am I getting um, my learning and my growth and my development opportunities from? Is it from pursuing a hobby? Is it from actually expanding mm. my scope and my scale because Again, it's limited when you work for a particular organization. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm a little bit guilty of also going, well, wh wh I want more. I'm still hungry. So back to so the how have you tackled that then? Because I think that you just nailed it there. It's like people want more, but they don't know where to get them more from. So how have you then filled that you know, deficit in your cup, if you like? Yeah. Uh, so one of the other things that I'm involved in, so I'm also <laughs> a non-exec, which I know that you are. So for me, that is like the growth. Mm -hmm. So I will often be the most knowledgeable sustainability professional in, in the rooms that I'm in, um, but I'm not necessarily as commercially um, astute as others might be, or don't necessarily have that board level experience, exposure, governance, um, finance, audit committees, renew mm. all of that, right? So for me, that was always an untapped area uh, that I wanted to explore. And so now that I am sitting on this board, that is, it's literally for me that, satisfying mm. and filling that cup of learning, growth, hunger, being exposed to like diverse, in terms of diverse backgrounds, people who have far more knowledge and experience than I do, but also knowing that I add something different, mm. a, a different flavor to the mix. Um, mm. That's one, definitely one big area, most recently that I've been pursuing that is just keeping me, you know, less hungry. How, and how did that opportunity come about? I don't mean necessarily the specific opportunity of being yeah. an NED, but how did you go, how did you formulate sort of a plan or was it just really organic that you were like, I need to do something more. I know that these are skills or things that I want to learn about. And did you go out and actively seek that or did it sort of come to you? Yeah, it never really happens like that, right? It's never really a plan. It was a, a chance conversation with mm. somebody. Uh, somebody literally said, can you do me a favor? and um, can I pick your brains around a sustainability mm -hmm. role they were trying to fill in their organization. So I did that um, in, lo in, in exchange of a pizza. And Always the best yeah, exchange. The best payment method is Cards, pizza. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, and then he said, look, I've spoken to my CEO, but I just couldn't articulate it in the way that you did. Would you mind um, having a conversation with him? And I was like, come on, this is more than a pizza. Mm -hmm. That's a big ask. And I was also on maternity leave at the time. So I right. said, fine. You're, ex-colleague of mine, I was like, okay, fine, I'll do, the, I'll do you the favor. And as I was talking to his CEO, the, 
they were they were just exploring like ah uh, you know would you be interested in this role that we're trying to scope out and I said like maybe five years ago because I'm, I'm mm. way more senior in, in terms of where I'm at and actually what I'm looking for is more scale more scope um, a, a, an opportunity to influence at a much larger scale. And he said, oh, it sounds like something like a non-exec would be really interesting to you. We're actually about to hire for one. At which point I thought, wow, this is like the dream. I, and I know how hard it is to even get a foot into that door, um, especially given how young I was, female, um, not had any board experience necessarily um, in the field of sustainability. Mm. You know, Usually they're like finance, HR, marketing professionals, not necessarily sustainability, quite niche. And then it was an opportunity we explored. I spoke to the chairperson, but this is also during the pandemic. Mm. So actually they were in a bit of a crisis and they needed somebody with a financial background. So that kind of, it just, we parked the opportunity. But in that process, I'd spoken to a, a recruiter six months later, that chance conversation, that favor I did for a friend converted into the recruiter calling me back saying, hey, we've got this opportunity. We think you'd be great for it. And mm. then the rest is almost history. I mean, it's a really rigorous process that I went through and the rest of it. But, you know, it was that chance conversation that even got me onto the books of this particular specialist recruiter that then opened up the opportunity of the non-exec role that I carry out now. So you, it's interesting because what I'm getting from what you just said is like network. Yeah, uh, it's every single opportunity. And I love how you opened your answer, which was like nothing's ever planned. Mm -hmm. Every single opportunity and every single thing I've ever done has come from just randomly knowing someone who knows someone who asked me to do something who that, that's led, then led to another conversation that's then led to me being on a stage in NetWest with Gary yeah. V, who's the reason I started building my personal brand in the first place. Like everything is, is almost like a, a beautiful combination of chance, mm. luck, however you want to spin that but almost always stems from an individual that I know and who knows me and has thought of me. But also, I think, grounded in kindness. Yes. So it wouldn't have happened if I just thought, oh, I, I, like genuinely, I was like, I'm on maternity leave. humility, day. right? I'm in my own time. Actually, I don't have time or capacity for this, but mm. it was like extent, extension of that kindness. It's like, oh, people have often done me favors. Mm. Yeah, sure, fine, I'll jump on a call even though it's super inconvenient. Um, it's that whole thing you were saying earlier about putting that ladder back down. Like mm -hmm. it might be putting the ladder across and just saying, yeah, this is okay. This is slightly out of my way, but yeah. And not, and not doing it with it, the expectation of anything return, no. which I think is mm -hmm. like, I talk about this a lot in context of personal branding. Like if you want to build a strong personal brand, you have to give away as much of yourself and as much knowledge mm -hmm. as humanly possible without the expectation of anything in return. Because when you don't expect anything in return is when you get things back. And I think there's always an expectation both in what I do, but also in the context of what we're talking about in networking of like, that's a strategic person for me to know and I can go and ask them for something later on. That's not how that works. Yeah. You, they need Can't to be trust transactional. you. Yeah. I'm not gonna give you my contacts and introduce you to people if I don't know you. You need to go into these things with humility and, and kindness. And as you said, like almost doing people a favor yeah. without wanting anything back. And it's also just, I think, being, um, you know, saying yes to things. So when opportunities come about, it's just by embracing them and going, yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? And and nothing may come of it. Um, and that's also fine. But then everything could come of it. But then everything could come of it. And yeah. that's, that's the gamble, isn't it? I love that. I feel like we're on the same wave in terms of how we live our life. I'm just like, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just see how sure. it goes. I don't think ever. I don't think anything in that life is that serious. And I literally did a post about this yesterday on LinkedIn. I said, nothing is that deep. No, yeah. unless someone's died, no one's died. Like, yeah. it's all good. Like, everything is comebackable from, like, even when you say something dumb in a presentation, which I do all the time, or, like, maybe upset someone or miss a mortgage payment or a credit card. Like, everything you can recover from, nothing is that deep. And I think yeah. if you have that, view on life things tend to be yeah. slightly more enjoyable than than if they didn't i use that word a lot by the way what's like, that it's just not that deep no it's not it's written like no one died i say i say all the time here like people will be panicked over a client thing and i'll go guys yeah. it's not that deep we're selling social media services mm. like we are not doing brain surgery like mm. it's not that deep i wonder if brain surgeons say it's not that deep ever <laughs> probably not i mean <laughs> And maybe, I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they don't want the pressure of like worrying about whether or not they ruin someone's brain during, yeah. their, during their surgery. God, I hope there's no uh, mic'd up surgeon somewhere and catching all that kind of stuff on, on, uh, on camera. So talk to me about what you're doing now. So, so you're working at a pretty high level in your field, to be honest. And as you said, like, it's very, very niche in what you do. It's not, you know, CMO, like that 
kind of traditional yeah. um, need within a business, you're, you're really kind of hammering the sustainability and yeah. responsible capitalism, really conscious capitalism. Yeah, and I've worked for a number of different retailers and often actually what's at the, what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to sell bananas or sell office space mm. or sell coffee, whatever it might be. It's a, sustainability is not at the core of what mm. the business is, is there to deliver. Um, but I love actually balancing sustainability with a customer centric mm. proposition. I think that that's the beauty. It's like often people say, yeah, but don't you mind that you work for an organization that has such a big footprint? Or I was like, yeah, but imagine how much bigger it would be if I wasn't there. And so I think these organizations are always going to exist and these services are always going to be in demand. My job is to make them as low an environmental impact as possible. And I think it's about marrying the two, which is like, actually, we know that there are commercial gains to be had. Not always. I think there's a perception of sustainability costs more, you know, mm. green premiums, um, t technology, as an example. It's like, oh, it's more expensive to buy an electric car. Yeah, but it, it is upfront. But are you looking at it at the lifespan of the car and it's like trying to get people to shift their mindset and their attitudes and their approach to be honest over the last 15 years it's, it's gotten a lot easier mm. so 15 years ago who knew about sustainable there was no david attenborough documentaries there were no netflix there was no al gore uh there was no extension rebellion there was no Gre greta so actually there's been a wave of um i think mass adoption of the fact that we are in a climate crisis and we all have a role to play I think people I mean, have. COP is a great example of that, right? People yeah, taking it seriously. Exactly. Uh, it, and in mainstream media, not in those niche kind of journals that I would receive, you know, it's preaching to the converted, but actually mainstream understanding of the, the crisis that we're facing. Um, but it's still, it's a, still a tough sell. It's a tough mm -hmm. gig, right? At the end of the day, people have got their own metrics and KPIs that they're all working towards, often, um, you know, sales or profit centric. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of all that, people also, I think what I try to do is like, marry the commercial proposition with the environment like there's a cost now it's either a cost to our PL or it's a cost to our planet mm. how do we find that happy medium and often it's a lot of negotiating that we have to do but also it's humans making this decision and they often get it mm. so actually what i found is in it, throughout my career is like the, the biggest ambassadors are those that just on a personal level, want to do more. Mm. And then therefore, on a, in a professional capacity, try to help more uh, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. But ultimately, yeah, my, my philosophy is we need a planet to do business on. I want to I kind of come back a little bit to the sort of P&L versus kind yeah. of cost thing, because I think there is a narrative that, that stems both sides of this fence, and it is very much a both sides of the fence, which is capitalism's evil, th that is the, you know, no one should want to do that and isn't that and money's terrible and that kind of stuff and then on the other side is actually no we need to we need to do business in order for people to live and all that kind of stuff and normally on either side of that fence it's the sustainability is not actually our problem and on this side of the fence it's how dare you not take this seriously we're all going to die mm. and i think it's it's interesting that you seem to straddle like you're kind of the middle person between the two going actually there is a place where both of these ideals can exist which is we all like nice things. We all want to be able to travel. We all want to have, you know, a home that we can heat every day. Um, but also we can give a shit about, you know, yeah. our how do, planet. How do we do it responsibly? That's yeah. it. Um, and it's the same. And I, I always kind of try to relate it back to people. It's, like, it's the same thing you do at home. It's, mm. it's honestly no different in terms of what we're asking you people to do in the workplace. It's just do everything in moderation, do it sensibly, think about the consequences. And you may still make a decision knowing the consequences. I may still go on that flight, mm. but it should be compensated elsewhere. Mm. Um, it means that I don't, you know, get the car. I don't drive into work. I, I take the train or I mm. walk more to the supermarket. So I, that's how I, my personal contribution is. Like mm. I compensate within my daily actions, the uh, inactions I know I'm going to take, if that makes sense. So I know I'm gonna holiday once a year, but I make sure I'm good throughout the rest of the year. Mm. Uh, so it's a little bit of like that kind of, yeah, you wouldn't leave the light on if nobody's in the room. You wouldn't do it at home. You, why, why would you allow that wastage to happen in the workplace? That, and that's really interesting because I think actually a lot of people are overwhelmed. Like going back to you, I know we're kind of going a little bit down a garden path here, but I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed with the whole impact thing because you see things like Extension Rebellion and, you know, the absolute extremity of the movement of looking after our planet. And even myself, I look at that sometimes and I'm like, well, 
like that I'm not going to be vegan. I'm not going to stop traveling. Like I'm going on five, five, ten different flights before the end of May, and I have to go on those yeah. flights. Like, and so for me, I think sometimes it's it's very easy to look at the kind of media narrative if you like and go, well, if you're not with them, you can't. You have to be against yeah. them. And actually, to your point, everything in moderation, right? Recycle. Like don't leave a tap on if you're not using it. Like these are all things that you get trained as yeah. a child from the basics of your parents of like. Don't put, like, for example, my parents, I don't know if your parents were the same, but I'd be like, oh, it's cold in here, they'd be like, put a jumper on. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's I mean, no like, turning over the heating here, it's like, put kids. a jumper on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I now do that to my children because my parents taught me that. And actually, they used to do it not necessarily from a, an environmental perspective, but more from a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. And God knows I do it from a cost perspective now. I'm like, we do not need to have that heater on because yeah. it's so bloody expensive to run it. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's a, a but, with us or against us sort of Yeah, and, and for example, you mentioned vegan, right? It's not about being vegan but it is about understanding your protein intake, mm. your red meat intake, mm. your dairy intake. Mm. Like it doesn't have to be so extreme. Um, I myself, am, I'm not vegan, but it's about trying to get people to make those small changes because actually mm. the biggest thing that we could do is probably not to stop flying. It's actually to stop take, as much. take a look at our diets. Oh yeah, with the so, meat and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and so red meat consumption, dairy consumption. Again, if you're going from twice a week to once a week, that in itself would halve the emissions associated with food, which take which makes up thirty percent of the world's global greenhouse gas emissions, mm. it comes from food. The food that the land that we're using to farm this food, the production of that food, the preparation of that food, it's it's all in the food. Mm. So we think it's travel, it's um, tech, it's all these other things, but actually, food is the biggest single thing that an individual could do, um, or, or looking at their diet is the single biggest thing that people could do. And I don't think it needs to be extreme. Mm. I watched a documentary on Netflix actually recently, I forget the name, forgive me, about this topic. And it, they interviewed a bunch of farmers who'd gone from mass scale farming who were you know, doing you know, a million chickens or pig farmers or cow farmers where they'd actually taken the land back and then were now becoming like solar farms and mm. um, you know, kind of almost going against what they'd always done because actually they were seeing the impact that their work was having mm. on not just the environment but the local community and you know um, for example in in uh, the states they have these huge pig farms and obviously pigs produce a huge amount of waste and that waste then for gets filled back into the local community and that causes a lot of issues and all that kind of stuff and I think the interesting thing that you're talking about there is it's this moderation thing we yeah. all think that we can change the world or want to change the world it's like when you set new year's resolutions you set yourself these ridiculous goals mm -hmm. and of course you fail at every single one of them because you fail to look at the actual small things that you do every day i actually read an article about this and i've, I've spoken about this article a bazillion times on this podcast so forgive me if you've heard me talk about this before um on a platform called cracked which is a user-generated forum um it's quite interesting actually but the article i'm talking about spoke about the impact that your actions have on other people and how Normally, people can only think of consciously between 80 to 150 people. So you'd be one of my people now. Mm -hmm. A news anchor would be one of my pe my people. An influencer I follow, my family, my friends, etc. These are people who are in our conscious consideration. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, you don't consider. So you would never consider the binman's eyes being blinded with the bleach that you've mm -hmm. thrown away without putting the cap on because he's not in your consideration. You wouldn't think of the dog that was walking along the road and cut his paw on a pit glass that you dropped because mm -hmm. it's not in your consideration. And lots of the art article actually said was imagine if everyone just considered one percent more mm. people so if your total capacity is 150 people just you know you know one more person or 15 more people or three more people you could actually change the world mm. because if we were all just that little bit more conscious of what our, the actions were to our actions or reactions to our actions yeah it would have an absolute trickle effect to your point cut your day cut, like if you eat meat twice a week eat it once and then you yeah. cut your emissions by 50 percent it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and, and people often say, yeah, we really want to do more for the planet. But like you said, it's overwhelming. We just don't know where to start. And so I think that's really where we're trying to focus like our efforts in terms of, when I say out, like how, how sustainability professionals try mm. to engage people is like, what can you personally do mm. within the capacity of your role? But then also how can you take some of that into your daily life? So what would be, let's, let's split that then. So at home, what would be like a few things that you can do that would, that are very, little in terms of impact to your life but would have a massive impact if we all did them yeah back to diet it's got yeah. to be your weekly shop or your takeaway indulgence or whatever it might be it's the food that we consume uh, far surpasses the impact of 
the energy that we are using in to heat or light our homes, etc. in a traditional household. So what would that be? Like red meat, chicken, like, like what would your suggestion be? Yeah, so it's transitioning away from red meat. So again, it, almost the hierarchy would go red meat, chicken, fish, vegetarian, vegan. Right. So that's the kind of emissions impact and how, how you could see it reduce. So basically as much vegetables and vegan stuff as humanly possible. And then eat as little. But again, like that already would scare people off, right? It's just about. I don't know if it would. Like I I, I eat a huge amount of vegetable based meals, but they're not intentionally vegetable based. Like for example, last night I had ramen Hmm. and I didn't put, I mean, I had chicken egg in it, um, but I didn't have any meat or anything just mainly because I couldn't be asked. Um, (laughs) I think think as soon as you tell people you can't, it's it's just polarizing, right? It's like, what do you mean? Why why can't I? Yeah. But actually, if you think what, what legislation is driving, it's driving us to not be able to do stuff. You can't mm. use plastic bags. You know, at once once upon a time, it was like you can't use leaded fuel. Mm. Um, so we've been through a lot of these transitions and I think actually, if we want mass adoption of anything, there's got to be something like legislative that's mm. driving it. My personal views is that, you know, you need like, you need one rule for all. Mm. And we're starting to see this emerge, right? So there's like meat taxes as mm. an example, just like we've seen in the sugar industry. So how you get a sugar tax, you they're now taxing meat. We're seeing like innovation come through in terms of meat alternatives. We're seeing, I think it's just really difficult because the me- messages often are mixed mm. and they often change. Um, you know, once upon a time it was five fruit and veg on a plate and then it's like actually, no, not too much fruit. It's too, it's too uh, high in sugar or like, and so I think dietary wise, mm. it's really difficult because the, the messages change. That's quite also often. super subjective, right? Like I've got various different allergies and things like that, which means that a vegan diet for me would be unbelievably painful. Like mm. I just couldn't do it. So most of my diet is meat and fish and very, um, a lot of vegetables as well. And a lot of like pasta and stuff with vegetable sources, but I couldn't do the vegan thing. So, you know, it has to be subjective, right? You can't say necessarily one rule for everyone because that's not gonna suit everyone. But what you can do is give guidance and say, yeah. to your point, there is a scale, find yourself on the scale. Yeah and don't feel guilty about it. It's like everyone as a human being, right, is on a, a spectrum of like introvert to extrovert. Where, or, there is no such thing to me as a binary of you're this or you're that. We're just all somewhere along a spectrum, yeah. both in personality, the way that we think and all that kind of stuff. And your, your diet and your approach to kind of keeping the planet alive is probably yeah. one of those things. Yeah, and I think that it's about people don't make the connection. Mm. So if I said to you, your food had an environmental impact, if we hadn't had this conversation, you may or may not even have considered that. You'd think about the calories, perhaps. You'd think about the nutrients. You'd think about the health Mm. of the meals that you're consuming, perhaps the micronutrients. But you wouldn't necessarily think, ah, there's an an emissions associated. Oh, this is worse than getting a flight. Do you think they should put it on the packaging? I think that if they were to put anything on like packaging, calories. this is 200 calories. This has 50% sugar. But this I think has the currency needs to be understood. Yeah. So what's a number? This is anyone? 20 car journeys. Yeah. Yeah. It needs to be really relatable. It mm. needs to be consistent with mm. everything that, you know, it doesn't need to be just on one milk packet. It mm. needs to be on every single item. Um, yeah. But, but I think it's also, yeah, it needs to be a currency that people understand. And, but, but, we have to do it at the most basic level, which is, hey guys, the food that we consume has a huge environmental impact and there are changes that we can make in order to reduce that impact. That's mm. the message I think if everyone understood, we'd be in a much better place. Because then it's again, it's about making informed decisions. You can mm. still go for your your red meat burger if, if that's what you want to do, knowing the consequence, knowing the impact, knowing the consequences. Mm. Um, but actually there's probably a huge population that will go, you know, we know that actually 40% of EU citizens are flexitarians. Mm. So, Actually, those people that are more on the fence might go, ah, yeah, maybe actually I'll go for the, the lower carb- uh, the lower carbon option just mm. because I'm not fussed either way. We could spend all day talking to you about this because this is a really interesting conversation, but I want to move on. So you're a mum. We kind of started that right at the beginning. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to kind of understand how you juggle being, I know acutely how hard it can be, like running a business, I've got two kids, single mom, like it's it's every morning I have my kids, it's absolute fucking chaos. I'm shouting at someone to put a shoe on or <laughs> put their lunchbox in their bag or why haven't you brushed your teeth yet, etc. How do you manage like dealing with a job, dealing is the wrong word, but managing a job that is, you know, at the forefront of staring down the abyss of where we're going mm. to be whilst also raising children that you want to be happy and not worrying about things and, you know, but also want to raise and give them the same values and morals that you have so that when they grow up, they can also kind of have an impact positively in the world. 
I mean, I definitely read climate change for babies to them when they were little. <laughs> so my son, who's six, understands the concept of climate change. It's really well explained, actually. It talks about it, the, at- the world having an atmosphere, and that atmosphere is basically like a blanket that's mm. keeping the earth too hot, and therefore the earth is getting sick because it's too hot, because the emissions that we keep putting out there is making the blanket like really, really thick. So yeah, it actually was quite educational for me. But so making them conscious and aware of the world that they are growing up in, um, but also saying, but this is why, this is why we're going to shower today and why we're not going to have a bath. Mm. The earth, the earth's not going to feel too well if we keep having baths. You know, it's like it's a great way to message the fact that they personally can have an impact mm. in terms of the actions that they take, um, how we operate at home, lights off, recycling, uh, no wasting food all of that kind mm. of, again, it's how we were brought up and raised, but for different reasons, right? Mm. Usually cost driven. So yeah, super conscious of the fact that they need to be aware of like what I do for a living, why I do it, and also the world in its current state and what it could look like, both good and bad, right? If we don't take action. But I think on a more practical level, how do I juggle it? Um, yeah, I guess a little bit like you described. It's <laughs> chaos. It's, it's, chaos in the mo- it's, it's chaos in the morning. Sometimes I'm like, Gosh, if the professional, if the people who know the professional me could see me right now, they probably wouldn't believe it. Um, but I, yeah, I, I reach out to my, I'm very fortunate to have a village of people who, who support me in kind of my endeavors, my personal endeavors, my professional endeavors. Um, so lots of help, in all honesty, which I know I'm really, really fortunate to have. But also it's like striking, you said it's a juggle. Yeah, it's it's a juggle, it's a balance, it's a blend. It's all of these things in one. Um, it's a it's riddled in a huge amount of guilt also. I was literally about to ask you about that. Yeah, a huge my amount of guilt. Like, my son said to me the other day, mommy, is there one day that I could come home at 3.30 instead of going to after school club? And I just thought, oh my gosh, I felt as a mother. <laughs> like, mm. damn, he just wants to come home and spend time with me. Um, mm. So I know my, my Monday to Friday is can be quite intense in terms of focus on on work and the day job but I certainly make up for it on the weekends Mm. and and I said I celebrate life you know everything is a celebration in in our household it's not just birthdays it's half birthdays it's (laughs) it's um anniversary everything it's like uh today's the first day of um school like you're gonna come down to like balloons and oh you're starting year one and it's like everything's a thing because I feel like we should celebrate every milestone and probably rooted in the fact that it it was a real struggle for me to even have children Mm. and so I just feel so grateful every single day so in the moments of they're not brushing their teeth even though I've asked them 10 times I kind of ground myself in in like gratitude of yeah imagine like six years ago I longed to even be able to have Mm. this rant Mm. and so now that the fact that I'm able to have it is what keeps me going um I, that is a really powerful message. I had I was in my car um, last night with my kids coming back from the from the from the school after school club. Same yeah. thing. My son says, "Mommy, can you pick me up at normal time like yeah. the other kids?" And I'm like, oh. "So I have a rule that on Fridays I pick them up at normal time, and I am now mum mm-hmm. from three thirty until the end of that day, and obviously the weekend too. But we go and do swimming together, and it's like that's our time. And that makes me feel slightly less guilty about all the other times that they've had to be in after school club until six p.m. But we were in the car yesterday, and um, in my head I was going, right, well, it's, you know, it's quarter to six now, so that means I have to get, you know, them to there, which means they have to get in bed at eight o'clock and whatever. And I was listening, almost like stepping back from myself, listening to myself talk about it in my head, and I was like, does it really fucking matter if they're in bed at eight or 8.30? Mm-hmm. Like, why am I rushing them to bed? I haven't seen them all day. And that's the first time I've kind of consciously, I guess, thought about why, what's the rush? Like, and it, not just in the context of getting the kids to bed, but what's the rush in life? Like, what's my rush in hitting that next milestone here or whatever? Like, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, you said celebrate the moments. I think mm. there's a lot of joy that can be found in just sitting in, you know, don't worry about going to bed at eight, let's go to bed at nine, but let's play with that Lego thing because you really want to yeah. do that. Or, you know, why are we kind of killing ourselves to hit that next career milestone only to then want to kill ourselves to hit the next one because mm. we never actually sit in our I don't know how to describe it it's almost like you, you want to get up to that ceiling when you hit that ceiling you then want the next ceiling yeah. you never actually sit never at the satisfied. level no ever and I think part of that is from ambition like you're mm. clearly very ambitious and I'm really ambitious and I think in many ways that's a disease because you are just constantly like in a rush mm. how 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 did you have you always been like that you've always wanted to celebrate the moments has it been particularly motherhood or you know, in your struggles to have children or is that something that you were like, 
how did that kind of mindset come about? Yeah, I think definitely motherhood has, has made me even more conscious mm. of that. But I've, I've never been very materialistic, right? Apart from my sneaker collection. <laughs> which is probably the only thing I spend money on. Never been very materialistic. And it's always about creating memories or like, yeah. I'd rather catch up with friends. It wouldn't matter where we went, what mm. we were wearing. It was just the fact that I was with friends and I was mm. going to have a laugh. And it's very similar with like how we have fun on the weekends. It's never about the, the things that we're doing. It's mm. just the fact that we're doing them together. So mm. definitely our, our kind of new mantra at home is like presence, not presence. Mm. Um, because all they really want to do is just sit down and play. Mm. And that costs nothing. It really doesn't cost much. And so rather than saying, oh, as I'm washing up, you go and play with this toy. It's literally like, again, like you said, screw the washing up. Mm. It doesn't need to be done in matter. this moment. And um, let me go and sit and play and and explore and uh, you know be creative and be messy and do all mm. of these things with them. Because mm. that's all they long for. It's interesting. Some someone said to me, it might have been my mum actually, and I think she got it from Amanda Holden on the Italian <laughs> job. But uh, yeah, bear with me. <laughs> Um, she said uh, that your children only want to hang out with you for 18, 18 mm. summers. And then, and I think it's something like 90% of the time they'll ever spend with you is spent with you before the age of 20. And then yeah. it's the 10% after that. And that really made me like go, oh shit, I've already used mm. six summers up with my daughter and f nearly five summers up with my son. And now we're moving into the seventh and the fifth. Like, shit, I'm running out of summers. Yeah. <laughs> like, I need, we need to sure. go and do some stuff. Um, and actually, I am very materialistic. I love stuff, mm. um, but I love important stuff. For me, I'm not that asked about the latest fashion trend or what sneakers everyone, I love clothes, sneakers, but I'm not bothered about what's yeah. trending and what's that kind of stuff. I love doing things that are fun and we can create memories. And mm. so whether it be going to Bubble Planet for the weekend or yeah. going to just, to, even just to going to David Lloyd and hanging out in the soft play and being that mental mum that's running around the soft play and all the children are for like, I love being silly. And I think yeah. as a parent, it can be really difficult sometimes, particularly when you're managing a, a high performance, high stress job to not want to come home and go, I need some time by myself. So let me just go and lock myself in the toilet while the mm. kids are playing. Or let me just go and do that washing up while the kids are playing over there. Or let me get them into bed really early so I've got an hour before I have to go to bed. Yeah. Because you feel like you need to decompress because that's how we've been hardwired. But actually if you sit on the floor and play Lego with your children. That's decompressing. It's the best form of it. It's the best. And it's so much more enjoyable. But I don't know yeah. why, but we convince ourselves that we need to do that alone. Yeah. And by in front of the TV, like TV's fucking shit now anyway. Mm. <laughs> like there's nothing on TV I want to watch. So, you know, playing Lego with the kids and making crazy little figurines and stuff. So, so come, come five o'clock most evenings, I'm thinking, right, soon I'm going to go home. What am I going to do? Yeah. And I and then I literally have half an hour with them every evening, right? Because by the time they get home, mm. they eat their dinner, they they get into their pajamas, they have their milk, and then they've got like half an hour max wind mm. down time. And that's where I'm like, okay, today we're going to do dominoes. Today we're going to play chess. Yeah. Today we're going to make, yeah, make this Lego. We're going to open this. So um, it's almost like planning the fun so you make sure it And happens. also it just gets me out of the, the work zone. Yeah. Because it gives me that, oh, I'm really that's looking forward to, down. really looking forward to going home now because they don't know what I've got in store and I've got this in store for them. So the excitement that's that I take from it. such a good mindset, mindset shift. I feel like a lot of people go home and go, oh God, I have to get the kids to work. That actually should be, mm. what can we do? Yeah, what are we going to talk about? And yeah. and my son is super inquisitive. So every night he wants to watch a video about something random. So That's yesterday true. it was how is chocolate made? Very random, but it's something we learn together. Because yeah. um, also how is chocolate? Like, how would you know? Yeah. You wouldn't know that unless you dedicated the time to kind of watch it. Um, the other thing that we found out together was he wanted to, under ah, so... My husband was driving in a car behind me, mm. but his phone was still connected to our car's Bluetooth. So we heard his music, which was very random. Uh, but my son was like, how can we hear daddy's phone? I was like, oh, it's because it's playing on the Bluetooth. What's Bluetooth? What's Bluetooth? So we went home that evening and we, f we Googled what's Bluetooth. And it talked about the waves, the frequency. And honestly, this probably shouldn't be a, um, it shouldn't have been as educational to me as it was. <laughs> but it talked about how Bluetooth and microwaves work on the same frequency. Mm -hmm. Oh no, sorry, Wi-Fi and microwaves work on the same frequency. I was like, oh my gosh. That's why your stuff does stops working when you use your Every microwave. Every time I go to the kitchen to take a, like while I'm prepping my lunch or on a call and I'm warming something up, that's why I kept yeah. thinking the reception in my air, um, sorry, the Wi-Fi in a particular area of my kitchen must be bad. Mm. It's not, it's the, the microwaves. Microwave. 
duh. Like I, I learned that very recently too. Yeah. Um, actually through my dad, fun enough. Um, because my Google Nest sits on top of my microwave. Oh, and I was yeah. like, the bloody doorbell never connects. And he was like, yeah, because it's on top of the microwave. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, they're on the same frequency. I was like, oh. Yes. <laughs> it was like a light bulb. So both of, both of us have men in our lives yeah, that, are educating, that, that are educating us about us. this stuff. That's really interesting. I love that. I love the idea that you're looking forward to going and doing stuff with your kids. Mm. And I have to be honest, I haven't been like that. Like, I think the last couple of years, I've been very much that very high stressed mum who's like, you know, just trying to make ends meet and like get the kids mm. to bed and like keep everything focused and da da da. And actually, it's been the last six months that I've just been like, none of this shit really matters. Yeah. Like, genuinely. None I think of it as soon as you take that kind of pressure off yourself. Mm. Um, Because I always had this view of like what a good mom, like what a good working mom should look like. Mm. And I, again, try to kind of change the narrative in my own head. It's like, I'm not a working mom. I'm a mom who works. Like it's definitely that way around for me. And like, what did I do it all for? I did it to be, I wanted to be a mom more than anything. And now that I am, I need to make sure I'm putting that role first. But also deeper than that, like, a, ma- a working mum, a mum that works, like you're just a person. Yeah. Who, true. you know what I mean? Like they're both really important parts of your life. And I actually wonder whether you would be as good of a mum as you are if you didn't have something that you were really passionate about. Yeah. Like I personally was, a, I was a stay at home mum for 10 months, 15 months. And I hated every second of it. Mm. And I was, it's not because I didn't adore that time with my daughter. Like I'm so grateful that I got to have an extended period of time with her. I went back to work after my son after three months. Okay. But it made me miserable because my brain wasn't stimulated. I was alone a lot. And I'm someone that needs a lot of energy from other people. And to be, I'm very curious, like, you know, I can relate to your son massively. I used to get grounded all the time and in so much trouble because I'd be like, why? Why Why does this happen? Why don't all the teachers hated me for it? But, so I can understand that, but I need that stimulation mm. in my life, which is part of the reason why I do this podcast because I want to meet new people. I want to learn about new things. You know, you operate in an industry that I know nothing about and you've educated me on a huge amount of things just in the last kind of 45 minutes that we've been sitting here. But I, I don't think I would be as good of a yeah. mum if I didn't have that and vice versa. I wouldn't be as good of a, yeah. a, a business person if I wasn't a mum because where would my joy come from? If it only came from work, do you really want to work until you die? Probably mm. not. So, yeah, I d- how have you managed to find that balance? Yeah, definitely. Like, echo yeah. exactly everything that you said, right? So it's not about one or the other. For me, it's always been about both. And and obviously, people in their own circumstances make their own yeah, Everyone's choices, different. But, everyone's sub- yeah, it's but for me, it's always been around, I know what I'm doing at work makes me a better mum, mm. as you described it. And I know being a mum allows me to bring my best self to work. Like, yeah. all the skills that you possess or that you learn um, as a mom, patience being the most important, yeah, <laughs> probably gosh, the most yeah. important one. My son is definitely like they're all <laughs> transferable. They're all applicable in the workplace. And I think, you know, one of the things that has certainly, I've tried to actively change is the role of parents in the workplace, mm-hmm. right? So I am a, unashamedly a mom. I talk about, mm-hmm. yeah, sorry guys, not in, the, not in the best place today, just had this episode with my son or with my daughter, or it was a really tough morning, tough night. Like. Don't, I don't want to have. I don't feel like I need to hide that because I'm a professional mm. um, woman in the workplace. Actually, that's part of who I am. It's mm. part of the package that I come with, and I think that speaking openly about it just gives other people a voice. Because then everyone goes. Everyone then chimes in with, "Oh yeah, you know, similar challenges." Or mm. they might not even chime in with their with their own kids. But yeah, my dog was not well, and mm. I couldn't sleep, and and so it just creates that safe space for. I think as soon as as a leader, you show a little bit of vulnerability. Um, it allows others to kind of feel like it's safe for them to be their their true selves in the world. It humanizes you. Yeah. I've I it's funny because I do the same thing but not for the same reason. I do it more to warn my team that I'm fucking exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> so like I you know I've been through a pretty nasty divorce over the last couple of years and so I'd come in some days and be like guys I've just had a meeting with my lawyer and I'm not mm-hmm. in a good headspace can you just give me a second. Yeah. And it was more to give them context yeah. that if I'm not great but actually, I, you made a really good point there, which is that's probably given people a lot of... Yeah, and if you think about 10, 15 years ago, you would you would hide that because oh, you'd sure. see it as a, you know, it might be perceived as a weakness or what are people going to think? What are they going to say? And actually now it's like, it's. I think there's definitely this showing up as yourself mm. unashamedly is way more accepted and than it ever okay was. being okay with the consequences of that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I want to I wanna cover a little bit, if possible, we kind of mm. segued back to motherhood and then back again on greenwashing because I feel like sustainability and 
you know, looking after the planet and, you know, environmental um, impact and all that kind of things is important. And I think a lot of companies know it's important, which is why, you know, you, you're doing what you're doing and, you know, you've obviously made the impact that you've had. But how do you strike the balance between actually doing good and saying you're doing good, mm. which, I, which I think a lot of people think that how, you know, how could a FTSE 250 actually give a shit about the planet because they make money? Yeah. Like, wh where's that, how do you strike that balance while making it attractive to customers and internally, but also? Yeah, it's a really tough time for sustainability mm. professionals at the moment. There's a lot of you know, fear of being accused of greenwashing. Mm. Um, certainly my approach is you need to, like there's, there's value in sharing. Mm. Because once, as soon as, and, and this isn't necessarily even in the context of sustainability, it's like, imagine who that might inspire. Mm. Imagine the action that it might inspire. So yes, I, I definitely agree that there have been some cases where you're like, come on, like that is, there is no fact. It's not grounded mm. in any fact. But I think when people are doing, are, are trying to make steps, um, sustainability is a journey. It's not, hey, we've done this and therefore we've solved all of the world's problems. But mm. I think that's the expectation that's almost put on sustainability professionals. It's like, how dare you talk about, making one step in in the journey if you've not made all 10 talk mm. to us when you've got when you've done 10 but it's too late to get other people moving so mm. i think that there is definitely much more of a balance that we can strike in terms of i don't think it should be used as a marketing tool this isn't your route to get more customers i think it should be a case of how do we ed educate a lot of these companies are talking to a whole host they have a captive audience and they have an opportunity to educate that audience. Mm. And I think that they're quite uniquely placed to do that. So I think if we could shift the dial from education-driven narrative rather than self-promoting, mm. then we'd be onto something. We'd be onto potentially a winning combination. It's interesting, you know, because I'm, I'm kind of of the view of, yeah, so, so greenwashing, any kind of washing of any particular cause, I think is just nonsense, particularly for, from a marketing perspective. Yeah. If you're only doing something to get more customers, that is based in value and moral, I think that's a bit of a, a, a pretty gray area. Obviously I'm a marketer, so I would do anything it takes to get new customers, but I think you can, ethics wise, there's, there's a yeah. line I just won't cross. I would never post something I don't believe in, for example. Mm -hmm. We have pretty hard rules internally about what I will and won't say on the channels, um, even if everyone else in the world is saying it, because I'm like, well, we don't believe that as a company, so why are we gonna put that out? However, the other part of me feels like, is being cancelled, therefore off-putting to companies to even try. Like for example, you know, a lot of companies will put rainbow flags up on their logos mm -hmm. during Pride Month. But then you have accusations from, and look, I'm someone that believes this also, you know, I've, I've made accusations to companies before, I'm like, well, you do nothing, nothing else. You, mm -hmm. you do nothing else in your organization to support and make, you know, be an ally and be inclusive. Yeah. So why the fuck are you putting it, you're literally just using it as a marketing tool. Um, and that's really frustrating, but also of the same mindset on the same the other side of the coin, I'm almost like, well, if they don't do that, then is that worse? Yeah. So it's like, you know, you either do it and get canceled or you don't do it. And then <laughs> like people think that, you yeah. Don't care. So it's almost like, is actually greenwashing a good thing? Because at least then it's bringing it into the, the light as opposed to it being like, we're doing nothing. Yeah. I think if there's a, you know, if there's a strategy and a plan behind any progress that's being made and that's being shared, mm. then that's valid. Mm. Um, I think that also it can't omit too much, right? right? So you mm. get, often get people going, ah, oh, here's all the great stuff we've been doing and then not talk about, I think transparency, <laughs> it's, just, it's just transparency is yeah. key, which is um, people want to know about the whole, not just, you know, the shiny bit of mm. the apple. They want to know that there's 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 a bit on that side which is really bruised, but you're working on it or you have a plan for it. Well, this goes back to what you were saying a minute ago about you coming to the office sometimes, like I had a really shit morning. Like it's, yeah. that, it's that vulnerability piece. Yeah. Even the thing is, and, and I know this acutely because obviously it's what we do as a business, but the more human you can make mm. your brand, the more money you will make, which is obviously then a great sell at board level mm. as to why you should be humanizing your brand, why you should care about something. Like, you know, you only have to look at brands like Tala, for example, they sell active wear, right? They sell women's yoga pants, right, as a business. But the reason they're one of the most successful brands that do it in the UK is because the founder, Grace Beverly, has a purpose and her purpose is to create premium stuff that people want to wear, but at its core does no bad. Like, you know, she uses sustainable products, she's vegan herself, etc. And 
the brand doesn't lead with that. It doesn't say yeah. we're the sustainable sustainable brand and you should have to be vegan to wear our products. It leads with we make really we make your ass look awesome. Oh, yeah. and by the way, it's made with recycled bamboo or you know. Um, uh, I don't know what nylon that's made from fishing lines or whatever it might be and that therefore I think is a really organic natural yeah. human way to be as a brand because even human beings like you could be the vegan veganist vegan in the world but there's going to be gray areas for you yeah. you know like I've got a friend who's vegetarian but she, every now and again when she's on vacation she'll eat like an egg and bacon like, okay, well, you're not a vegetarian. Yes, she is. <laughs> like, it, you know, there's People are giant balls of contradictions. And mm. I feel like the more you can make your brand honest in its giant yeah. ball of contradiction, the more people actually like it yeah. and buy from it. Yeah, transparency yeah. is absolutely key. People don't want to be duped. Yeah. They want to know the facts and they want um, the, their newsfeed to be based on those facts as well, right? So... Yeah, and I th like yeah, and I think also the leadership within those businesses have mm. to be honest. My biggest pet peeve is when you go to, you know, you turn the news on and um, you know something pops up from I don't know one of the large oil companies or whatever, and they're like, well, we're aiming for carbon, you know, net zero by this year, and then it's like, well, actually, they just you know started drilling twenty new mm -hmm. um, mines over the last five years, and it's like that where it, the math isn't mathing. Like, are you doing this or are you doing that? And I think that's where that whole greenwashing thing comes in of if the intention is is there, even if you're doing the bare minimum, it's yeah. better than the intention not being there and yeah, making it exactly. seem like you are. And and also they are transitioning and that, sh that is there to be celebrated because they could equally do nothing. And so I think, that, again, this is, this is the kind mm. of challenge of sustainability professionals is um, we should be celebrating progress mm. and we need to recognize this is like, we don't operate in the same time scales as any other profession, right? People are thinking, oh, what's my two-year plan? What's my three-year plan? Maybe even five-year. We're thinking about 20, 30, 50-year horizons. Mm -hmm. And so small steps now are are going to be the big steps later. They're going to count for the big steps later. So I think that, yeah, we shouldn't shun those companies that are starting to yeah, make small waves, albeit waves. And wow, isn't that like the true of everything, right? Mm. Like, you know, you said small steps now make big steps later. Like that's your career, that's your life, that's your business, that's your everything. Like you can't change the world in a day. Like if you want to climb Mount Everest, you have to do it in base camps like, yeah. <laughs> or in camps. You can't kind of do it, well, unless you're NIMS. I don't know if you've seen that Netflix documentary and just smashed it out in like 12 hours. But <laughs> Like not everyone can do that. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. The last thing I want to ask you about this before we kind of wrap up, and I know... I could talk to you forever about this kind of stuff because as I said, I know very little about it. So it's been really interesting to kind of learn from it from you. When it comes to these, you know, large corporations and or even small businesses like mine, I think one of the biggest things that we've just been touching on is is incredibly overwhelming to make any kind of statement that's rooted in beliefs because, you know, we've seen wars started over belief systems. You know, people fall out with their family over belief systems. You know, the Trump Biden election literally divided families because they were either red or blue. And I think people often underestimate how important people's belief systems are. How, as a company, can we lean into, and I'm kind of selfishly asking this from Clout's perspective, lean into, I guess, supporting those beliefs to a degree, but not so much that it then becomes our entire business because we're not a sustainability business, we're a personal branding agency. And I want, I want to do something that's good, but I also don't want to piss anyone off. Yeah, I think the first step that organizations can and should take is just to understand their impact. Because mm. then you've got on paper, okay, here are the areas that have an impact. And, and that impact can be defined in different ways, right? It could be environmental impact, it could be social impact. And there's no point of having it for having its sake. I think it's about understanding where is that materiality? What's the most like mo a most uh, significant area in which you could contribute. And now you could argue like, actually it's not a huge environmental footprint, but we've got a huge social impact footprint that we could really try to address. I think if you understand where your impact areas mm. are, um, it will, I think it will quite naturally and like you said, organically um, surface as to like what you personally as a small, as a small business focused in marketing could do. And it could be around giving on un, un, the underrepresented a voice as an example if it's mm. if it's in that social sphere you know it's it's unlikely to be a material environmental impact and mm. again there could be lots of things that you could do on a smaller scale but actually it's probably more likely to be the, there's probably a bit more of a social play and that could be 
you know, pu- your purpose-led um, route to, to pursue. Which is arguably more powerful. Interesting. What impact do you want to have? Oh, what impact do I want to have? Um, it, generally, in life? Yeah. Just if, I, if, you, if you could, if you're fast forward 95 years old and you're looking back on your life, what do you want to have, have achieved? I mean, I'll tap myself on the back to getting to 95, for sure. Well, modern technology. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably all be 120 by, the, by, um, by that point. Yeah, I, I'd say definitely something around having made an impact in terms of the work that I do day in, day out mm-hmm. in the organizations that I've worked for. So helping organizations understand the environmental impact of their business and help put in place tools to address it. I'd say it's probably bigger than that. I just want to have impacted people and, and the legacy that I would want to leave is um, she was kind, she was helpful, she was creative, and she was always there. Mm. I think availability is something I, I pride myself on. It's like anyone could call me at any time and I would pick up, respond, offer a helping hand. I think that's just like my nature and that's definitely how I'd want to be remembered is that she was always there. And I think that really translates in your personal brand as well. I think that, you know, you put a lot of content out which is there to educate people and mm. to help people. How Was that something that just organically started happening because, because you are that way or was that kind of a strategic, I want to get my message out there and make more of an impact with more people? Yeah, it was, it was because I was in rooms where people didn't look like me, sound mm. like me, they weren't the same age as me. And I found it honestly bizarre. I was like, why are there more people like me mm. around the tables that I'm around? How do I get them there? And it, that's where sharing my personal story, my personal journey kind of began. It was like, it was to invite more people around the table. Uh, and then it morphed into oh, I have an opinion on on this, or I really struggled with this. If I put this story out there, perhaps somebody else might benefit from it. And it's very much, actually a lot of my content is self-therapy. It's like processing, it's validating, it's understanding how I was feeling about certain things in certain moments. And the only thing that encouraged me to, to share it and to put it out there in terms of out there in the ether has been somebody saying, oh my gosh, I found this so helpful. Mm. And I thought, wow, if it can help one, maybe it can help more. D- did you ever feel nervous in sharing? Yeah. Every single time. I mean, still, I still feel nervous in the content I put out there because often it's not about, it's not always just my story. You know, if it's a story about my motherhood, my family, uh, my challenges to conceive, it's just, it's not just my story to tell. I think also culturally, it's like, it's not what we do mm. as, as like South Asians. We mm. don't, you know, air our dirty laundry. Um, you know, it's, it's be, um, yeah, it's almost like be seen, don't be heard. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's a kind of, I guess what's, it, again, it's, it's there. It's never been said to me um, that it's not okay to put out your story, but I was very conscious that, again, like the representation isn't necessarily there. And is there a reason for that? Maybe we're not supposed to do this. Maybe we're not supposed to share on these kind of forums. Um, so yeah, I've always felt nervous about posting the content that I do and also being a woman being you know, like you know often it's about what I've achieved mm. or what I've done and so I, I, I recognize that that can come across for some people in a certain way but I think that's on them and it's not good for me I'm doing it from a very genuine place and it's about sharing and inspiring and perhaps helping others on their journey it's not self-serving in any way um, I mean it can be self-serving for sure and I don't think there's anything wrong with that but like I'm doing it in a in a way that's to educate and to inspire and to empower and I think that yeah more people need to do that because we're all on the search for content but mm-hmm. we're all also content creators we can be and we should be because we all have a story to tell and I think our stories are going to be the most powerful things that we're able to share. I think yeah self-promotion is not a dirty word. No. Like, I think a lot of people particularly in the UK are like oh why are you doing that? And I definitely had that when I first started posting content. Mm. My friends were like, why are you posting content? And I'd be like, you know what? They don't get it now. They'll get it at some point. They still don't get it, but now they kind of understand why I do it. They're like, I don't really know what you do, but go you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I think a lot of people struggle, you know, to your point about you feeling nervous every single time you post content. It's taken me four years to get to Mm. a place where I give zero shits. Absolutely none. Actually, let me caveat that. I care about what people think of my character. Mm -hmm. 
I don't give a shit what you think about my opinion. Yeah. You, you, you could disagree with me all you want. And actually, I quite like it when people disagree with me because then it opens up the opportunity to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult, I think, to have a dialogue in content, whereas you can have a dialogue in comments. Or you can have a dialogue in DMs. Or you can have a dialogue mm -hmm. in like this. Again, yeah. one of the reasons why I enjoy doing this. I, I don't want to just talk into an echo chamber. I want to have a challenging conversation about things that I mm -hmm. think are interesting. Um, but it's taken me four and a half years odd to get there. And I, I struggled and I can really relate to what you were saying there about every time you post, you feel nervous. For a very long time, I was like, oh, should I say amazing or fabulous? Does fabulous yeah. sound too feminine? No, I shouldn't say that, yeah. I should say something else. And it's like this constant, what if I say something that's gonna upset someone? Yeah. And actually what I've realized is, do you really care mm -hmm. whether you upset someone or do you, are you conditioned to care? And I wonder whether that stems all the way back to our childhood of, you are taught to pay attention, taught to do what you're told, taught what to think, not how to think. Yeah. And the children that, that that are like wanting to learn how to think are the ones that get detentions, the ones that yeah. <laughs> get in trouble. I was definitely one of those kids. And yeah, it's an interesting one because I, I really, going back to, you know, you said what you want your impact to be. I want my impact to be that people look at me when I'm 95 ago, she was the one that encouraged me to be who I, who I want to be. Yeah. Like that's, and that's where this personal branding thing comes in. For me, it's not personal branding. I'm great at it. You know, again, fuck being humble. I'm really good at it. But actually the thing is much deeper for me than that, which is I want someone to go, yeah, Amelia was the one that made me get to where, like reach my potential because she gave me the kick up the ass to do it. And I saw how confident she was. So I want to be like that. So yeah. I'm definitely walking away from this conversation thinking, yeah, I want to I want to do more. Yeah, you should. You should. Your message is really really important. I think also your your personal story mm. is really powerful as well. Which leads me nicely onto my final question. You know, I say all the time just fucking post it. We've got a massive neon sign over there that says just fucking post it. If there's one thing that you could just fucking post online with zero consequences, what would that be? Such such a difficult question and I think that it would probably be something really quite personal because mm -hmm. I still feel like as much as I've tried to let my personality kind of shine it's still the professional me you know mm -hmm. this is Jazz Rabadia who is a Working. sustainability professional yes who has two children and had a struggling you know a, a challenging journey to motherhood I think it would be rooted in who I really am mm -hmm. so it would be the I, I think it could be a post about anything but I would love for it to be an unfiltered post. This mm. is who I am, this is what I'm feeling in this moment, and I haven't had to think about whether I use fabulous or amazing. Mm. I love that, and let me give you a bit of advice. The post that I, I do those posts all the time now, but the first post I did like that was the biggest viewed post I've ever posted in my life. Mm. Challenge for 2024 for jazz. Definitely food for thought. Put something out that's really vulnerable. What's the worst that can happen? Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much you. for having me. It's been me. amazing. I could keep talking forever. Thank you for listening to this episode. I absolutely love doing these podcasts and I would be able to reach a hell of a lot more people if you like and subscribe. So thank you to all of you who have already liked and subscribed. And if you haven't, please subscribe and leave us a five-star review so we can reach more people.